Second to language bread is the most influential innovation in all of human history. Notice that I did not say it was the best. Working the land to get the grain needed to make bread is a lot of hard work. Many wars have been fought to expand empires that are run on bread. I might even argue that one of the main reasons for war is to have more land to grow more grain to make more bread. This alone would take bread out of the running for the best innovation. However, bread has influenced so much of our way of life, our language, our religion, and more that I call it the original influencer. Some argue that grain is the most influential innovation. While this has a lot of merit, I would argue that without bread, grain would have a lot less influence and be relegated to an occasional foodstuff, not THE staple food for more than 2,000 years. Hi friends, I'm Jay. I'm a history teacher, and I'll take you on a journey into history through the eyes of bread. This is episode one, The Influencer. In this introductory episode, we will take a look at the many influences bread has had on our language, religion, and our way of life. But before we dig into bread, I'd like to let you know that you can find more about me and about Eyes of Bread at eyesofbread.org. You can also find more about me on Instagram as Mix Professor. And of course, if you like what you see here, please like and subscribe and engage in the comments below. What is bread? The dictionary defines bread as a foodstuff made of flour, water, and a leavening agent that is mixed together and baked. This is a good definition of leavened bread, but what about our unleavened breads? Before we can get to the great sourdoughs history has to offer, we have to look at the, the hunters and gatherers who may have baked bread over an open fire, the Natufians who created the oldest bread oven in the archaeological record. Finally, we will approach the Egyptians who perfected sourdough, which was the earliest and most prolific of the leavened breads. We can't talk about bread and grain without talking about bread's sibling, beer. Bread and brew are cognate. This means that these two words come from the same word. Sometimes as language progresses, we have words that come to have two meanings, and then they split into two or more words. Bread and brew are one example of this. We will also have to mention bread's children. Bread and beer were the first children of grain and led to the proliferation of many children products, which we can find in our larders today. They include cereal, pasta, cakes, and so much more. Bread can be made from many different grains. The most common grain to be used for bread is wheat, which accounts for about 20% percent of all dietary energy for humans worldwide. Rice, another common grain, accounts for another 20 percent of our dietary energy. While usually eaten as, well, rice, it can also be used to make breads, pastas, and other foods. It can also be brewed to make rice wine. Maize is a late arrival for the European diet, but was grown in the Americas for almost as long as the other grains. Note that maize is called corn by us Americans. However, I'll use the more accurate term of maize throughout this podcast. Maize now accounts for more than 5% of the world's dietary energy, and much more in parts of the Americas. Grain in general accounts for more than one half of all dietary energy consumed by humans worldwide. Grain is the seed of a variety of plants. Cereal grains are the most common and the ones we'll focus on the most. However, cereal grains are not all there is. Cereal grains come from members of the grass family, including maize, wheat, oat, rice, millet, and more. We will also visit the non-cereal grains, 
such as pulses, pseudocereals, and oil seeds. Pulses are members of the legume family and include beans, peas, peanuts, and more. Pseudocereals include amaranth, quinoa, buckwheat, and others. Oil seeds include mustards, asters, like safflower and sunflower, flax, and others. Now that we have defined bread, let's talk about the many influences bread has had. Reviewing my thesis, which is second to language, bread is the most influential innovation of all of human history, it is not the best. Many of the influences bread has had can be argued to be bad things, depending on your perspective. However, they were still influences. In fact, bread is so influential, it has even influenced the most influential innovation, language. Let's start with some of the obvious influences bread has made on language. In English, bread, and later dough, are terms synonymous with money. These, however, are modern terms. The earliest known written account referring to dough as money is 1848. The first written account of using bread for money was in Robinson Crusoe in 1719. We know that words are probably in common usage before they are written down, so it could have been hundreds of years earlier that bread came to mean money in spoken English. In fact, we have strong evidence for this. The Old English word for bread was cloth. This is the predecessor of the modern word loaf. The Old English word chlafwerd meant head of household and was a compound word of chlaf, or bread, and werd. Werd is where we get ward and warden in modern English. Werd basically means guardian. So a chlafwerd is the guardian of the loaf or the guardian of the bread. Bread was so valuable that we had the man of the house guard it. That word chlafwerd has been compressed over time and still exists in modern English as the word lord, which is the head of a noble household. In English, we have many other bread-related phrases. The breadwinner is the one who brings home the bread or money. The upper crust is the high society. When you are pregnant, you have a bun in the oven. Not all terms for bread are positive, though. If I get angry, I might say, you're toast. I'm going to give you a knuckle sandwich. But wait, that's not all. When you have a meal with someone, we want that someone to be someone we enjoy spending time with, a companion. Companion comes from the Latin com, meaning with or coming together, and panis, meaning bread. So a companion is literally someone that you eat bread with. This word companion can be found in most Romance languages. In Spanish, we have compañero. In French, compañón. Portuguese, campinero. Italian, campagno. And Catalan, company. Now, I don't speak these languages except a little bit of Spanish, so my pronunciation may be off on those. That brings me to another related English word, company. When you go into business, you also want to be willing to break bread with the people in the company that you have to accompany, right? There are a few other words from the Latin panis. A pantry is the place you store your bread and other food. A pannier is a little used word that is basically a fancy word for a bread basket. Impinate, another little used word that I think should be used more. It means contained or embodied in bread. Maybe impinated would have been a good name for this podcast. Empanada 
a Spanish word that has jumped into English, is a pastry filled with savory ingredients and baked or fried. Mmm, yum. A panish is another fun, rare word. It is an allowance of sorts. OED defines a panage as the provision made for the maintenance of the younger children of kings, princes, etc. So it is the bread that is given to the royal children. I didn't want to limit this discussion to English, or we could say that bread only influences English. I'm not a linguist. In fact, English is unfortunately the only language that I speak well enough to hold a conversation. However, I have searched for other bread terms. As we learn about different areas of the world, we will talk more about the bread-related terminology that is common in that language. As I said, I've just started breaking the surface, and I only have a few terms here. If you know more, particularly if you speak the language, please go to eyesofbread.org. Go to the language of bread and fill out the form there to let me know what you know. Spanish has pan y pelo, the bread and stick, similar to the English carrot and stick. I don't know about you, but I'd be more motivated by a good loaf of bread than a carrot. Unless that's a carrot cake. I do love a good carrot cake. In Minecraft, you can ride a pig using a carrot on a stick to guide the pig. In the Spanish version, it should be a bread on a stick. In Arabic, they have a phrase meaning, give the dough to the baker, even if he eats half. He knows his job, let him do it. You do your job, it may cost you, but it is worth it. In Polish, they say, it's a roll with butter. It's so easy, it's like putting butter on a roll, similar to the English piece of cake. A Persian proverb says, Bake bread while the oven is hot. Do it now. Don't wait for the oven to cool down. While the oven is hot, let's talk about religion. Many religions have referenced bread in both a positive and a negative light throughout history. As we get to each region, we will talk more about that region's religions and those religions' references to bread. However, to get us started, let's take a look at Genesis 3, 17 to 19, and then we'll have a quick look at the Greeks before we wrap up with a section on religion with a list of several other bread religions from around the world. The Hebrew Tanakh, which is the same as the Christian Old Testament, starts with the book of Genesis. This story tells of the beginning of man, including his exile from the Garden of Eden, and why bread is such hard work to produce. A little background for those not familiar with the story. Adam and Eve were living in luxury. They had all the food they could eat, the most beautiful scenery, and lots of love. They had just one rule to obey. Don't eat from that tree. One day, a serpent came along and convinced Eve to take just one little bite. After she did, she understood more about life and convinced Adam to take a bite as well. They had broken the one rule, and because of this, they could not stay in the Garden of Eden any longer. God came to them, judged them, and gave his verdict. For this, I will read from the original King James, which is my favorite English translation, even if it is a little archaic. It reads, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. So here, God says to his beloved Adam, Dude, 
I give you one command. Don't eat it. Because you did, you have to leave. The tree imparted knowledge onto Adam and Eve. Since they had the knowledge, they could not stay in the garden. They had to leave. And out there, there was not all this great food. You will have to work hard for your food instead of just picking it from the vine. He continues. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The Hebrews thought of growing wheat and making bread as hard work and painful toil. You will sweat and work hard just for bread until you die and return to dust. Not all people considered bread to be a bad thing. The Greeks thought men were like wild beasts before agriculture, placing the growing of grain on a higher plane than gathering food. In fact, the Greeks and later Romans worshipped gods that controlled various aspects of growing, baking, and enjoyment of one of their most important foods, bread. Demeter, daughter of Kronos and Rhea, sister to Zeus, is the Greek goddess of the harvest of the grain. Legend tells us that when her daughter Persephone was kidnapped by Hades and taken to the underworld, Demeter's attention was pulled away from the harvest and a great famine was brought upon the people. Bread was so important that when Demeter's attention was pulled away from her job, people starved. Demeter's sister Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, is also a protector of the bread. She was the firstborn of Kronos and Rhea. Kronos grew jealous of his children, so ate them all. Zeus, the youngest, evaded this when his mother fed Kronos a rock instead. When Zeus grew up, he forced Kronos to disgorge all of his swallowed children. Hestia was the last to be disgorged, and as such, she is both the oldest and the youngest of the children of Kronos. The Greeks, of course, had other godly and heroic protectors of their favorite food. Demeter's son, Bootes, invented the plow and wagon, key tools in agriculture. Kronos, the titan I mentioned above who ate his children, used a scythe as his key tool and weapon. A scythe is the tool used for harvesting prior to the advent of the tractor for the same job. In fact, there are dozens of gods and heroes in Greek mythology who have roots in agriculture. Other groups worship bread to various degrees. In Roman mythology, Ceres taught men how to prepare and preserve grain. Cereal is named after her. The Semitic god Dagon is created with teaching the Amorites how to build a plow. The Egyptians had a grain god they called Napur. Napur was later absorbed into aspects of Osiris. Many ancient gods, such as the Sumerian god Tammuz, are related to the cycle of life, death, and rebirth that we see in agriculture. These gods are often associated with grain as well. According to the Popol Vuh, an ancient sacred Mayan text, man was created out of a dough made from maize after clay and wood had not worked. As I could spend an hour just listing all the gods related to grain, we will talk more about them in more detail when we get to the region they're from. Now we will move on to talk about how bread has influenced our way of life. Religion and language hit the core of our way of life, but it is not all there is to life. Let's take a brief look at how bread has affected our lives throughout history. 
After we have basic survival tools such as hand axes and knives, we begin to have specialized tools for various tasks. One such task was to grind things up. Two early tools for this were the quern and the mortar and pestle. A quern consists of two flat stones placed one on top of the other. Grain is put between them and the top stone is turned to grind the grain. Instead of a quern, the more popular mortar and pestle is used by many cultures and is still in use in many times. You may even have one in your own kitchen. A mortar is a bowl and a pestle is a pounding stick. You fill the mortar with the material you wish to grind and the pestle is repeatedly pushed and turned against the material in the mortar in order to pulverize it. This tool is often associated with chemists as they use it to grind up chemicals. Pharmacists used to use these tools to grind their goods as well. Artists can use it to pulverize materials to use it as a base for paints. Probably the oldest use of this tool is to grind food. The oldest mortar and pestle I've been able to dig up in my research is dated to a Stone Age China some 35,000 years ago. As many are made of wood and will break down quickly, it is likely that there were mortars and pestles much earlier than this. While much newer tools, the sickle and the scythe are harvesting tools that also date to the Stone Age. These tools are seen in common cultures around the world. I mentioned earlier that Kronos carried a scythe. This was later adopted for the vision of who we now call the Grim Reaper. This tool can be used with great ease to reap both grain and men. The sharp blade cuts through both quickly and easily. The sickle is seen in many icons as well. The hammer and sickle represents the union of the peasantry and working class and is used as a symbolism in communism. It can be seen on the flags of many communist countries. Notice that these tools that are used for bread are also used in war and as propaganda in war. One such use of bread as propaganda was the statement that was commonly attributed to Marie Antoinette. Well, let them eat cake. The story goes that someone told Queen Antoinette that the common people had no bread to eat. Supposedly, Marie Antoinette said to them, Well, let them eat cake. Such a comment would certainly show her ignorance of the plight of the people, and propagating such a comment around the country would shore up support for removing these royals who eat cake when the people can't afford simple bread. It is, however, quite unlikely that Marie Antoinette ever said such a thing. First, this statement had been attributed to many princesses before Marie Antoinette was ever born. Second, there was no famine around that time and only one bread shortage which could be associated with this. Marie Antoinette's letters to families show she was concerned about the peasantry. She spoke of the people who treat us so well despite their own misfortune. As we can see, bread, grain, and agriculture in general are key ingredients in our modern lifestyle. Bread has played heavily in the development of every civilization as well as many non-civilized people around the world and on every continent. Over the next several episodes, we will be relying heavily on the archaeological record. We will have to make some guesses based on what the evidence shows us. We will have very limited written history to pull from until much later in the series. Even once we start having some written record, some of what we're talking about is so common that it is not written down. 
As we go, we will see how hard it can be to get a glimpse into the common life as people did not write about it. We will often run into roadblocks where cooks and bakers chose not to write recipes, presumably to keep it private. These episodes will look at the earliest times we know about humans. We will look at the prehistory of man, meaning the time before writing. We will look at some of the earliest cities around the world before we jump into early civilizations and city-states. Slowly, we will move forward through history. In the next episode, we will jump right into the deep end as we search for the first loaf. This is an area where we have to make a lot of guesses, with almost no data. These people had no writing, and much of the garbage they left behind that we now use as the archaeological evidence has been returned to the earth. Wood tools have long since rotted. Stone tools have been broken up by weather and other forces. Clay tools have found much the same fate. Little remains for us to learn from. Despite this, we know an amazing amount about how man evolved and how they may have first made bread. I look forward to seeing you on this journey. Please remember to like and subscribe. Visit me at eyesofbread.org. Until next time, bake well and have a tasty history.